Whenever I hear a writer friend saying they're typing, they're working at Starbucks, I always laugh, like, come on, man, you're already so cliche, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very rare. Most of the people who work in Starbucks who are tapping on their computers, at least in LA, right? Yeah. They want you to think that they're a writer. Look at me, I'm a writer. But if you are a yeah. real writer, in my experience, it's like you're not working in a coffee shop, you're working on a show. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jen. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about agents and managers. Oh, such a good one, Phil, don't you think? I think it's probably the most vital thing for anybody to know about how to become a screenwriter. All right. Um, what are we going to do? Well, I guess everyone wants to know how to find an agent or a manager. Well, the reason why you kind of need one is, so first of all, you, you can't submit. I, like I, people often say to me, well, can I give you my screenplay just to, just to get some notes or just so you can you know, whatever, keep me in mind for something in the future. And the answer is absolutely not because I have to, me and, and every other working writer in the industry, we have to protect ourselves. Like let's say you, you have a talking dog cartoon and you say, hey, I want you to read my talking dog cartoon and I, and I get it or whatever. I, I open it up, I open up the file like, oh shit, because now I, I have a talking dog cartoon. Like, we all have talking dog cartoons. It's not an original idea. But because I looked at yours now, now if I get mine on the air, you're gonna sue me because of, we both have terrible clammy ideas. And so naturally I stole yours. And that's not the case. It's just like, these are ideas out there. And the same thing with like a, a joke or an area. So most TV writers will protect themselves. They, we will not read unsolicited uh, scripts. We just will not do it. Even if you sign away or not gonna do it. Like I, you know, it, it's, it's just too risky. It's really interesting. So I just saw two cases of this. There's a showrunner who just on Twitter for his birthday announced, hey, I will read your script. You have to, he's a lawyer, by the way, you have to understand his, his career was lawyer and now he is a writer. Okay. So he has a waiver you have to sign and you have to agree to. And he mm -hmm. gave very specific parameters to get your script to him. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just retweeted another showrunner today and she's like, as a reminder, I will not read any unsolicited scripts because I have to legally can't because I have to protect myself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so, funny. so, so the case where you're seeing it, you have to keep in mind, like, I mean, they're attorneys or in the case of other people who do, you know, they'll read certain page counts of your scripts. They have attorneys who have drafted documents to protect. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Right. I don't, I'm not an attorney. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. Um, but that, so that's why it has to come through an agent. For some reason, when it comes to an agent, you have a layer of protection with the, with the uh, you know, and that's what the agents afford you. So, and I will only read a script, by the way, through an agent when it's, when there's something in it for me. And by that means like, if I'm staffing for a TV show, I need to hire people and then I'll read, I'll read, you know, the script, but I'm not going to read it as a, as a personal, you know, my pastime. You know? Well, well, right. And so obviously my, my response to you was a little facetious here. Uh, I was, I don't actually think that getting an agent or a manager is the most vital thing to your career. I think that mm -hmm. anyone who's listened to any of the podcast episodes so far understand the Michael Jammon answer to this is be a better, be a good writer. Yeah. Right. Yeah, not, better, whatever. Not, yeah. Not even a good writer. Be a great writer. Be so good. I can't ignore you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's another episode we'll talk about in the future. I'll, I want to go into that in great depth, but, but right. And so often when you get an agent, if you have an agent, that means you've you've surpassed you've gotten over the first hump, which is like an agent feels like you're good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then then I'll read like a, a, a ton of scripts. All the scripts that I read from new writers are they've already cleared that first hurdle. They're good enough to get an agent, but that doesn't mean they're good enough to get a job, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, you have to be you have to have a great script. And if it's like, well, I don't have a great script, well, I'll find somebody else who does. Right. There's somebody out there who has a great script, right? Right. So this is an interesting thing because I think I put an overwhelming amount of emphasis on this question when I was first learning how to be a writer. Because you, on forums and in screenwriting books and on websites, people say, well, you got to get an agent to sell something. And I think, well, I have an idea and I want to sell it, thus I need an agent. And mm -hmm. the truth is, um, you have to be so good that the agent thinks he can sell you. Right. Yeah. It goes back to our conversation on our last episode about sales. It's they are selling something and they are getting a commission for that. And they are not going to waste their time or energy on something unless they think they can sell what you have because you yeah. are a commodity. Yeah. And if you have, like I say, an agent, it's so interesting. There's a couple of things I want to explore. One is if you're up for, you want to get a staff writing job, you're not competing against other people on the outside who have never written before. You're also competing against staff writers who have already worked. 
mm-hmm. who are willing to do another do another year of, as a staff writer. So now you're competing against people who have never done it and people who have done it. Or and then maybe you're competing against story editors, which is the next level up from staff writer, who are willing to take a bump down in salary because they want to work. So now you're competing against people who have one year of experience and two years of experience. So you must be great. You have to be great. And then the agent who's going to sign you, they have a handful of clients and they're have, they have to service all those clients. They're already trying to get those clients work. So if they're going to bring on somebody new, that person, had, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to sell you because they don't, they already, you know, they got plenty on their plate. And so one way to make it easy is to have a fantastic script, not just a good enough script. Another way is uh, if you have a built-in, a built-in uh, marketing, mar- market arm, like you're already very sellable. For example, there was a woman named Sarah Cooper and she blew up during the pandemic because she used to make uh, viral videos of, of Trump. She put Trump speeches and then she would kind of uh, lip sync to them. But she wasn't just lip syncing. She would also add little comic touches to them and she'd edit it really clever. I mean, she put a lot of work into them and, and they were really quite, they were next level. It was next level stuff. And it blew up on, I don't know, Twitter or one of the social media platforms. And um, it became so big that she became known. She was an unknown before this. She was a, uh, an aspiring actor, comedic actor. She couldn't get, she couldn't get arrested. And right. because she did all this work on her own and she blew up on her own, suddenly it was like, well, it was a no-brainer for every Asian designer. She's already got a built-in platform. She already has a built-in marketing engine. And so she made it very attractive. This is, so this is an interesting thing where I, I think, you know, again, my perspective on this stuff kind of comes from a capitalistic perspective because of my business and, and marketing background. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about audience here and we're talking about, you know, attention. It's really the, what we are, what we're offering people is something to gather their attention and they have to be willing to trade their time and energy and focus for that type of thing. So when you're writing a script, you basically have to write something so good that someone is willing to sit through commercials or pay a monthly subscription to be entertained, Mm -hmm. right? And that's what they're looking for. And so what this girl has done is she has brought some value to the table because she already has interest. She's provided Mm -hmm. free entertainment to people and so those people want to see more of what she does. She has that audience. So I think it kind of speaks to what we're seeing now, which you've experienced recently with your book that you want to do, is people mm-hmm. care a lot about do you have an audience because yeah. you're bringing interested people with you. Yeah, right. And she also did, Sarah Cooper, along with others who do the same thing, she did all this for free. She wasn't yeah. putting up her content and saying, hey, someone pay me for my Trump impersonations. Right. You know. This was, she put a lot of work in it for free and expected nothing in return and got something in return for it, uh-huh. you know? So yeah. she was smart. And by the way, she was just as talented before she started doing these videos as she was afterwards. So it's the same person. So talent isn't quite enough, mm. you know? That's an interesting note, right? Like, yeah. like, and I'm trying to think of the exact saying on this, but talent, there are very, lots of talented people who go nowhere because they mm. don't have the work ethic behind it. Yeah, they are. And they don't have, right, they don't, they're, not, they're, not, they're actually not seeing the problem from the end of the, the, the perspective of the buyer. Like, what does the mm-hmm. buyer want? And, and let's say the agent is your buyer. The agent is the person who want you, you know, you want them to buy you. Well, what's in it for them? They don't want to work that hard. They want to find a new client who is, requires the least amount of work from, on their part because they have, you know, they got plenty to do. And if they find a client with a built-in marketing engine and is super talented and you don't have to convince someone to buy, you don't have to beg and plead and call, call in favors, you know, they don't have to hustle. No one wants, to, no agent wants to hustle for you. They want someone who's like slam dunk. They yeah. want that person to hustle for them. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting take. So, well, let's just assume then that I have the talent and I've got the goods, like I've got the energy and maybe I haven't for whatever reason hit it, I haven't gone viral, I don't have the following yet and I wanna get an agent. So I'm just gonna run a couple of situations by you and you tell me if you think these are good places to get an agent. Okay, yeah. and you may, not, you may not be able to answer these, but I think the you sewer. are. So yeah, so <laughs> uh, number one, pitch fests. Yeah, so I didn't, that wasn't even a thing when I was coming up and then when I found out the pitch fest, I was like, what is that about? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I'm i gonna have to say no. I actually, I, I read on Twitter, someone tweeted, oh, well, I got my agent or whatever. I sold the project to a pitch fest, but from 
I, for every one person who says that, like 10 others say, what a waste of time. They don't even send people. It's just like our, I think it's just a racket, honestly. Yeah. You know, because yeah. why would, it, if you're a producer and you wanted to get in touch with um, a talented writer for a project you're working on, like why in the hell would you go to a pitch fest? You'd go to an agency, you'd call a talent agency, say, hey, I got an idea for a project. Uh, I need writers. And they, within 10 minutes, there'd be a dozen writers outside the door saying, yes, I'm a, let, let's do this. Like you wouldn't go to some unknown. You wouldn't say, give me someone who's never done it before at a pitch fest. Yeah. And if, and maybe you'll say, well, okay, well, maybe they don't have much money. Well, if they don't have much money, how are they going to raise money for this movie or this TV show? Like, yeah. what's that about? You know, it seems, it just seems shady. Shady Did, AF. Didn't I send you a tweet by someone who basically was like, yeah, my first day or my first week on yeah. the job, I was sent to represent the company at a pitch fest. And yeah. I wore a suit and tie to try to make myself look older because I was like 21 and fresh out of college. Yeah, and so all these people were paying money to pitch this guy. It was his first week on the job. Yeah. And he was like right out of college. <laughs> so yeah. well, how do you think that's going to go? <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Okay, all right. So that's it. So similar screenplay contests. There, And I didn't even know that was a thing until you told me about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, that's a thing? Um, well, we see a lot of members of your course submitting to screenplay contests and pitch fests. And, and, and I think it's interesting. And some, like from what you've told me, there are two big ones, right? There's the Nichols, which I was like, but now I'm aware of. It's through the Academy. The Academy does that, and they pick like mm -hmm. 10 or 12 different screenplays, specifically features that they think have what it takes, and they give them a grant to just be writers to okay. finish that script, right? So it's a big deal. And, and then and then uh, Sun, uh, Sundance, right? So Sundance has a screen, it, and that's a little bit different because you're submitting information to join the, the to become a fellow. A science right. fellow. So you're joining either the director's lab, the writer's lab, the editorial lab, the documentary labs. And that's changed recently. And I, I've had, you know, fortuitously been able to attend to those. I've been a, a Spanish English translator for three years at the, at the screenwriting labs and one year at the director's labs. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely worth it. And that's an interesting thing, too, for anyone submitting there. You know, they told me they're not just looking for a good script. They're looking for someone with a body of work. They're looking mm -hmm. for a creative with a specific vision or a mm -hmm. specific story to tell. And famous people like Taika Waititi, who's blown up right now, uh, Ryan Coogler, like, they're all Sundance fellows. So it's a legitimate, um, not, right. not necessarily even a competition, though. It's you're applying to be a fellow. Right. The other ones, there are a couple like there's big, big break and like final draft and stuff like that. They, they have their own competitions. And I think there's some value in those because they do have actual industry professionals showing up to judge those and be involved. If that makes really? sense. Okay. Okay. But, but I definitely, you know, from my background in the independent world, I have seen the other side of this where you go on different, um, screenwriting contests or film festivals and you submit to win awards at these competitions and it's basically like one or two guys maybe a, a group of five to ten people and they're doing it as a way of bringing culture to their town or their small town and a lot of time what, what i've seen is that it's a money grab it's a way yeah. to it, you're making money and i'm making a living because every single person who submits on film freeway and there's a couple others they're paying like 40 bucks a submission for these things. Well, maybe we shouldn't mention any names. I, yeah, well, Film the film Freeway is the software where you submit. Oh, okay. It's okay. not an actual film festival. Okay, good. Right, so I, I don't, you know, I've been to some great film festivals and I think it's a lot of the networking that I have has come from attending film festivals because there are hungry filmmakers who attend those things. Right. But, but not... But those like, aren't contests. Not, yeah, exactly. But they do have a screenwriting contest portion Mm -hmm. Where you can submit oh, your see. screenplay and you just pay a nominal 20 to 40 bucks for us to review your screenplay and enter the competition. Right. But it's not like, you know, I, I think the best case scenario you can hope for any of these is like maybe an agent will find you. Right. I mean, yeah. it's not like you're going to the network is going to say, let's put it on the air. No, you it's, know, it's hopefully someone there. And what I've seen is typically the experts who are sitting on the panels and attending mm -hmm. and watching films or judging those things they tend to be some of the better contacts you get out of those events. Okay. But from your perspective, like it doesn't really seem like you find much value in a screenplay contest. I didn't even know they were a thing and I've been doing this for 26 years. So, but maybe that's just my ignorance. Um, you know, so it's, it's not like the winners land on my lap when I'm hiring. 
They don't yeah. land on my lap. Maybe they land, maybe if it's a big contest that lands on an agent's lap and the agent will submit it to me, that might, that might work, you right. know, but it's not, a, it's not a direct pipeline to success. And I'm the guy doing the hiring, right? Right, right, so that's interesting. Okay, lastly, um, and I, you know, we've never really had a conversation about this, but um, how familiar are you with the blacklist? Um, yeah, I remember hope when my partner and I sold a screenplay uh, a couple screenplays years ago. I was, we were hoping because it never get we didn't get made. But most screenplays for theatricals don't they do not get made, and so we were praying that it would get on the blacklist just because it would be an honor and it'd be that kind of it, it helps to market yourself. Hey, look, I'm on the blacklist, and and it's hard to get off the blacklist and to get produced, but it, occasionally it does happen. Yeah. Um, but I, it, you know, it didn't happen. We didn't, we didn't make the blacklist for, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't, I think it's like a bunch of industry people have to read it and they have to unanimously think that, hey, this is really good. And I don't think it made it, it was ours was even that widely circulated. So I don't think it was even an option. Yeah, I'm and there's, gonna... there's two sides to it. So yeah, you can be put on the blacklist and this is, again, this could be wrong. So if you have more information, if you're watching this on YouTube, comment below or let us know and, and we'll address this in a future podcast. But my understanding is it is um, industry professionals basically submit you and vote and say, these are the best screenplays that were unproduced this year. Yeah. And films like Arrival have come off the blacklist and been made. Right. Um, yeah. But then there's the other side of it where you can submit your screenplay and get feedback from industry insiders. Right. And now, you know, I'm not even, I'm not on the feature end. I'm, I'm in the TV, so I don't, I don't, the Blacklist, they don't really take pilots, do they? It's I think, more theatrical. Uh, I don't know. I think they take pilots. I think you can submit to television as well, but it definitely, definitely theatrical focused. So yeah. that's another thing. We'll look at it too, but if anyone knows, just comment and let us know. Yeah, it it's an honor to get on it. And I know it, it's hard to get off of it, you know, to get produced, but uh, yeah, I don't know much about it. Okay. Not much in the you know, honor game. I just want to get money. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so what do you think it is then? How, aside from the Michael Jamin answer of be a great writer, how do you get an agent? Well, it's really, it's really what, what do you bring to the table? And it's not your willingness to work as a, as a writer, as a screenwriter. That's not anything, you know, like I said, if you bring to the table your connections, if you are already on a show as a, as a PA or a staff or a writer's assistant, and you're this close to popping and breaking in and the showrunners like you, and they want to hire you, that you're bringing a lot to the table. You're already getting that first job basically. Or if you have a, like Sarah Cooper, if you already have a built-in marketing platform with a billion followers on Facebook, whatever the hell it's on, you know, you, that you have that audience. So it's much easier. And it's, it's it's sad, but that's just how it goes these days. It's not so much about talent, it's also about what else do you bring to the table. Hi guys, it's Michael Jammin. I wanted to take a break from talking and talk just a little bit more. I think a lot of you people are getting bad advice on the internet. Many of you want to break into the industry as writers or directors or actors, and some of you are paying for this advice on the internet. It's just bad. And as a working TV writer and showrunner, this burns my butt. So my goal is to flush a lot of this bad stuff out of your head and replace it with stuff that's actually gonna help you. So I post daily tips on social media. Go follow me, at Michael Jammin Writer. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And let's be honest, if you don't have time, like just two minutes a day towards improving your craft, it's not gonna happen. So go make it happen for you, at Michael Jammin Writer. Okay, now back to my previous rant. So then I guess here's the next question. What's the difference between an agent and a manager? I don't really know, and I have both. Um, <laughs> I, I, like have, I have an external perspective of what I've learned from trying to get these over years, but what are they telling you? Yeah. So, so the agent's job is legally to sell the script. Like they, they are the only one qualified to sell a script. They cannot, yeah. managers cannot make deals, but managers right. bring people on and basically work through and support the project, give notes, provide feedback and build relationships for that writer. Yeah, they do that. And all, in the beginning, you know, it's kind of being a little glib, but our agent, you know, our agent was the one who got us our first job. And so, yes, agents submit and they get you that job. And then as we rose up through the ranks, eventually you become high, so high that it's actually kind of hard to get a job on the staff. The next step is basically have your own show. And so you're either going to be a showrunner or maybe the second in command. And so... To be a showrunner or to get your, to sell your show, you often need to sell your project uh, with talent. And so a manager can usually hook you up with talent. There are other clients, and that's how it's worked in the past. We've done 
um, we've sold shows with uh, like comedians, like mostly big name comedians that they tear, uh, pair us up with their other clients. And so that's what a manager can do. It's, it's more of a long term thing, but they don't. Yeah, you're right. They can't make deals. They can't really submit you stuff like that. And and they also a manager can own. Not that this is a plus, but they can own a percentage of your project. They can they can help you produce it. Yeah. Whereas a manager agents can't do that. Right. But um, but it, and so this is an interesting thing. So. Um, do you know what the current what the rate is for a manager versus an agent? Uh, well, our, our agent takes ten percent, and so does our manager. Yeah, and I have heard of instances where managers have taken up to fifteen percent. Yeah, yeah, right. and, then, and then there's nothing left for the writer. Yeah, and then you have your attorney fees, right? Which is like five percent. That's five percent. Yeah. Yeah. So right out of the gate, you're between twenty five to thirty percent of your income. Yeah. Plus taxes after that, right? Yeah. But and, but this is an interesting point because I've. Again, I come from a sales and, and capitalistic background of I have goods and I'm trying to sell goods. And so oh, there are a lot of people who don't have that background who say, well, why would I want to give away 10% of my mm. project? And my response is, well, 10% of zero is still zero. That's right. Yeah, right. So. So, so if your manager can make the introduction and provide the asset to get the job done, right, making connection with that actor who will go in and you can pitch that project with them and the agent does the job of closing that deal and getting you the best deal they can, then that's money well paid because you're now getting 70% of whatever you sold instead of 100% of nothing. Yeah, and there was only recently, like about a year ago, the Writers Guild uh, severed ties with all all agents. So you had to drop your agent because uh, the, we were, our deal was, you know, there's there some shenanigans going on. So uh, the Writers Guild kind of severed ties. And so we had to rely on our manager for work during then. And then, of course, it's been, it's been settled. But yeah, now we have an agent and a manager and, and a lawyer. Awesome. Okay. All right. So what, what do, so we've talked about, like, we understand what to expect from them. Um, what else do you think, what else do you think is important to know about an agent and a manager? Well, an agent, this is kind of important, but agents, you know, I think that most people think, well, my agent will go and get me a job. They'll, they'll hustle. And like the agent, that's not really the accurate. The agent's job is more like to field offers. So when the phone rings, hey, we need a writer, or hey, we want to hire Michael Jam and, and see for Clamor's partner, they, then the agent will step in. They field offers. They're not going to hustle and fight too much because they have other clients. They have to maintain relationships. And if a deal goes south, like if, like let's say, uh, you know, I, I, we have a pilot and it goes south, how hard is my agent going to fight for me? I don't know. I, I suspect not too hard because he wants to make he still wants to keep his relationship with the network or the studio a good one because he has other clients to serve. Mm -hmm. So if you become too much of a squeaky wheel, if you become with your, when you have your agent and you start crying all the time, like in the movies, you'll see oh, this happens all the time. Uh, like uh, you'll see a, a writer calling his agent. What's going on? And the, I, and the agent say, I, I'm the agent's hand holding. And then don't worry about well, I'm promising I'm working hard for you. Like that does that call doesn't exist. I don't bother my agent with that kind of nonsense because you know, he's not a babysitter. And if I make myself too much of a nuisance, uh, he's not gonna work for me. Mm. He's gonna find somebody else to work for. Right, makes sense. Makes sense, okay. Yeah. All right. I wish I was a big, if I was a real big shot, then I could do that. But, yeah. um, you know. Okay, well, which, so which one do you think is easier? Like, if, I, if I'm a new writer, which one do you think is the easiest to get and where should I put my time and energy? I think it's probably easier to get a manager. Mm. I think there are, uh, yeah, I think it's in, in the beginning, and by the way, there are, there are four big, I should mention, there are four big talent agencies in Hollywood. There's ICM, CAA, William Morris Endeavor, and UTA, you know, the talent agency. And then there are much smaller, there are, there's the next tier, you know, Paradigm and a APA, there, and then there's some small boutique agencies. Coming out of the gate, you are not going to, no new writer is going to land it. At UTA, right? Yeah. Unless you're in a situation, right, where you're an overnight success like this girl, right? Who, yeah, right. right. It's because unusual. then it's like CA is like, okay, you we have a, a rare opportunity here to capitalize on an audience, so we should right. take her on. And and so you, you most likely you'll start at a small agency, and that's how fine a fine agent will give you attention. That's good, but there's an advantage to being a big one, which is, <clears throat> for example, like when we're staffing on a show. The first call I make is to my agent, and I say, "Hey, um, I need we need writers. Submit me your writers. I need young baby writers." And so that's how it works. They like the first call is my agency to send me his his writers, and those are the first ones I'll read. And if there's a good one, I'll hire that one. 
Why? Because I'm trying to make good with my agent. I'm trying to keep him happy. So, you know, but if there's no one that's right for the show, then I go to the next agency, you know, um, that's how that works. Got it. Got it. But a manager would be the easiest way to approach this. It, the it's... manager will help. A good manager will help you land an agent too. Mm -hmm. Cause they make yeah. the connections, right? Yeah. Right. They're, they're the matchmaker. All right. That makes a lot of sense. So, but this all being said, you know, I, I shouldn't even bother writing until I have one or the other, right? Because ultimately I need these things to sell myself. Yeah. No, you got to start. You have to always write. You have to always write. I am, um, you know, uh, the, there are, I can't remember what the numbers are. I, I ran the numbers, but there are slightly more active players in the NFL, including the practice squad. Yeah. Uh, there's slightly more working TV writers than there are at players in the NFL. Just a little bit more. I think it's like 2,200 versus 2,800. It's not a lot of people. So if you're going to be in the NFL, do you, you know, if your goal is to be in the NFL, do you work out once a week or right. do you work out every single day? Right. You know, I, I was, so, I was just listening to a Joe Rogan podcast this morning, and he's talking about this UFC fighter, Conor McGregor, which I don't know if you know who he is. He's kind I of know who he is. Yeah. So Conor McGregor recently was in a fight with a guy named Dustin Poirier, and it was round three. It was their third fight. And Conor broke his shin in the middle of the yeah. fight. Yeah, like, I saw that. Shattered it. And people are like, oh, he's old, and, and he should give up. And ultimately, Joe Rogan made this point. He's like, that dude is a savage because it was a known injury. They had it scanned. He already had a broken leg when he went in. And he oh. still went in, he still fought, and he was still kicking with that leg, right? And he went in, balls to the walls at the beginning, swinging as hard as he could, trying to knock Dustin Poirier out because that's who he is. And you have to keep in mind, this man has half a, half a billion dollars in the bank. Oh, wow. Because of other fights he's won. So to fight with that intensity and be that dedicated to your career proves the level of integrity of... of of energy and effort you need to be in. And they made this point. They said, you know, if I'm uh, a professional athlete, you can be a good boxer and learn takedown defense. You can stop someone with jujitsu or wrestling and you can get pretty far. But to be an elite level champion, you have to know jujitsu and you have to be really good at it. You have to know boxing. You have to know wrestling. You have to go to the cardio gym and you have to be working on all these facets of your craft mm -hmm. to be a world champion. And, and it's, it's, Something most people are not willing to to do. No, they just say, I have a script. Can't you get me work? Yeah. You know? Yeah. What can you do for me is, I think, the attitude I yeah. see a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the other way around. It's, it's what, you know. Yeah. But, but to your point, like, if you're playing, like, if you consider that NFL analogy, it's, it's you are playing at the elite level. Like, right. how many high school athletes don't make it to Division One football? Yeah. And how many Division I football players don't make it to the NFL combine, let right. alone get drafted, let alone play? And right, and you're coming after my job. You think I'm going to let you have my job? No. -uh. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and I've been doing this for for 26 years. I'm the NFL player who you, you, you haven't heard of, but man, that guy's still kicking around. Yeah, he's still on the team. Wow, good for him. Yeah. That's who I am. <laughs> yeah, because you put in the work, right? It's... You know, yeah. and not to knock people who work at coffee shops, right, or write at coffee shops, but it's something you told me to first move to L.A. is, you know, real writers are too busy to spend time at coffee shops. Yeah, most writers, every time, I, whenever I hear a writer friend saying they're typing, they're working at Starbucks, I always laugh, like, come on, man, you're already so cliche, don't do that. Yeah. It's, it's very rare. Most of the people who work in Starbucks who are tapping on their computers, at least in L.A., right? Yeah. They want you to think that they're a writer. Look at me, I'm a writer. But if you are a yeah. real writer, in my experience, it's like you're not working in a coffee shop. You're working on a show. That, that's what yeah. we call um, seamers, where I come from. They seem like they're doing yeah. the job, right? They seem, yeah. They want you to think that they're doing work. Like, like coffee shops is like a terrible, in my opinion, it's a terrible place to work. Yeah, like it's it's distractions. Loud, distractions. It's not comfortable. The seats are hard. There's, There's no whiteboard. Even, yeah, there's no whiteboard. Like, why would you work at a coffee shop? Yeah. Of all places. Yeah. All right. So ultimately, it comes back to the same thing we've been saying the whole time is ultimate, you have to be good at your craft. And not just good, you have to be great. I think that was a, one of the most helpful notes you gave me. Uh, we talked about the spec script that I wrote, uh, or it was a, a spec Mr. Robot for my TV mm -hmm. writing class. And, and you read it, and you gave me a, a great note. You said, it is obvious you're a competent writer, and this is really good. The bad news is it's not great. Yeah. And that has stuck with me for two years it's like it right. has to be great to stand out yeah. well you're constantly working on it so you know 
You have an advantage over people. You already have a huge advantage over everybody else in that you are now an industry insider because you are working on a TV, on a TV show. And because of that, you're around scripts and you're reading scripts and you're, you're around other writers and you're learning, you know, that's a huge advantage that you, but that was because you made a sacrifice. You moved here. Yeah, well, and it's, it is expensive and it is hard and I could be living a very complete, a completely different lifestyle if I lived anywhere else but California or yeah. LA. Um, I think I read recently that the, the, the average income in America like is $36,000. But uh -huh. L.A. County considers the average cost of living here fifty three a year, and that sounds low. Yeah, like like <laughs> it's it's a crazy expensive town. Yeah, but but you know I will say that one of the benefits of busting my butt as a writer's PA and doing my best to provide as much value as I could mm -hmm. in that position is they brought me back on to be a an office PA, which was a position I'd already had, and then I also got brought in to be the post PA. And I've been working on the same show for two full seasons now, nonstop. Right, because they like you. Yeah. But, but the cool thing is I get to see how you guys break the story. I get to read every draft. Mm -hmm. I get to see how it changes. I get to go into production. I get to see how they shoot the show. I get to see what changes happen the day of shooting. And mm -hmm. then I get to go and post. And I get to watch the showrunners make that final cut of their show and make those decisions. And I've learned far more being a PA than I think I ever learned in film school. Right. Are you sitting in on the mix too? Uh, I probably could if I asked at this point, mm -hmm. um, but I make it very clear that I don't, I'm not trying to get anything from anyone. Right. So I, I have been invited and I probably could at any point, but you know, I'm here to run tapes around LA. Right. That's my job right. and I'll do right. it and I'll do it as fast as I can. Right. All right. So good attitude. It's got a good attitude. Cool. Yeah. All right. That's a good, that's a good episode of yeah. a podcast. I think very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. And we got more coming up. So, uh, you know, I don't know. What do you got to do? So you got to subscribe to podcasts. Is that what you do? Yeah. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you leave a review at this point. Give us that five stars. It helps yeah. with, with our rankings. Uh, make sure you share it on your social media if there's something you find valuable. And then I would also encourage everyone to follow you on social media. Um, yes, please do. Uh, yeah, I'm at, especially Instagram, at Michael Jammin Writer. I post daily tips on Instagram. So go, yeah. go, go get me. Absolutely the right thing to go follow him there. I think that um, the members of your course specifically have said that the content you're putting on social media, are, they're gems of information. And, they, yeah, so and they've already been through your course. It's funny that they say that people... I, I, People will say that like, this is gold, and I'm like, uh, I'm like, when I post social uh, my social media posts, they go, this is gold. I'm like, no, dude, the gold is in the course. I wouldn't give you the gold. This is <laughs> this is just really good. The really really good stuff is in the is in the course. Yeah, so it's, it's good stuff. So check out the course if you haven't. Um, you know, I think one of the students of your course just said. You know, if you can save up the money, it will be the most transformative course you'll ever take. And he's taken multiple courses just like I have. And, you know, I could talk all day about how much I love the course and I'm glad it's there. And, you know, grateful that it's uh, improved my writing. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll see everyone next week. Very good. Bye-bye now. This has been an episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jammin and Phil Hudson. If you'd like to support this podcast, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing this podcast with someone who needs to hear today's subject. If you're looking to support yourself, I'd encourage you to consider investing in Michael's screenwriting course at michaeljammin.com slash course. I've known Michael for over a decade, and in the past seven years, I've begged him to put something together. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, Michael had time, and I have to say, I wish I'd had this course 10 years ago. As someone who's personally invested in most online courses, earned a bachelor's degree, and actively studied screenwriting for over a decade, this course has been more valuable to me than most of the effort I've put in because it focuses on something no one else teaches, story. In his course, Michael pulls back the curtain and shows you exactly what the pros do in a writer's room, and that knowledge has made all the difference for me, and I know it will for you too. You can find more information at michaeljammin.com course. For free daily screenwriting tips, Follow Michael on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Michael Jammin Writer. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Phil A. Hudson. This episode was produced by Phil Hudson and edited by Dallas Crane. Until next time, keep writing.